x is tonight or tomorrow, depending on how fast we go through this. So last week we looked at a little bit of a breakdown about when Moses was born and all that stuff. Okay, so let's put some pieces together. Moses was born approximately 1559. Remember, these dates can't be specific because ancient history is always a little bit unspecific. So uh, we're saying Moses was born in 1559. That would have meant that the pharaoh whose daughter, who had the daughter who adopted Moses, was a pharaoh named Second Enter Tau. He was in the south. He was not Hyksos. He was the southern, the, the southern Theban pharaoh. Okay. Now here's some interesting things that are not definite proof. They're just interesting. Something to think about. But once again, this doesn't really help us say definitely whether he was or not. Every single one of his children had the name Mos in it. Interesting that that's exactly where it dates to. Interesting, but once again, not not confirmed fact. Okay, just interesting. Maybe that's just coincidence. We have two unreliable sources, one of which is Josephus, but these are long afterwards, so they're not really considered um, something that's absolute. So we do have two sources who say the same thing, but they're unreliable sources. And they say that um, the princess who adopted Moses, her name was Thermuthis, and uh, second in her tau is one of his daughters is Tumoresi, which is the, apparently the, the two different um, languages, but of the same name, apparently. So that would, that would be kind of odd that right when we dated the Exodus, we have the same princess mentioned in Josephus. However, once again, these are not really proofs. They're more of just speculations. So keep that in mind. Um, Second Reiner Tau died in battle in 1555. Now, obviously, um, our, our dating might not be precise with Moses, so that gives us a few different possibilities. First off, Moses could have been adopted because the child murdering Pharaoh was dead. And the princess would then have been able to adopt. <laughs> Daddy wouldn't have been there to kill him. <laughs> uh, or it's possible that he was preoccupied. Second Enter Tau was uh, the first pharaoh where things started to turn a little bit more violent between the pharaohs of the north and the south. They started going more to war with each other. And um, then it was carried on with his son, um, Kamos, I believe was his name, but he, he died uh, in, in battle. And so then his other son, Amos... Uh, then went and conquered the Hyksos in 1530 or 1550, somewhere around there. So uh, we have that. The, the pharaoh um, who was the pharaoh when Moses was chased out of Egypt would have been, um, let's see, I believe it was Pharaoh Amos's son, uh, Amenhotep I, who is 1525 to 1504. Um, so if if Moses was born in 1559, 40 years from then would be 1519. And then Amenhotep I would have been the pharaoh. Um, he did have the influence of um, – he, he kind of came to, came to the throne or whatever you want to say um, when he was young. And so he had his aunt – um, I don't remember if I wrote her name down. No, I didn't. Um, who was Tim Tumoresi's sister uh, as an influence in his in his reign. So that fits. It's possible. There's nothing there that says that it didn't happen then, but that really doesn't help us say when it did happen. So Moses goes into exile um, for the next 40 years, which means that he came back sometime around 1479, which is the same year that we have a pharaoh that – fits. Um, now it says that th – so hold on, let me come back to that. So this would have been two pharaohs after Amenhotep I, and what would have changed is that now the pharaoh was from a lesser line. He wasn't from the direct royal family line. Now uh, because of that, he's going to marry a full royal wife whose name is Hatshepsut and to try and solidify his, his, his rule. So it would it would have been um, he already would have been in a place of trying to prove himself when Moses came, and then Egypt was experiencing a lot of wealth at this time, so he would have been arrogant as well. He already despised foreigners. We know all this. 
Um, and uh, so we have a lot, uh, some things that really add kind of layer to it, but once again, these don't give us proof of the Exodus. Um, he was young. I, I think that the account in Exodus kind of implies a young, arrogant pharaoh, so he, does, he would fit this description, um, this being Tuthmosis II. Um, he had no son by his primary wife. And so his his successor had to be um, a son from his lesser wife. So um, since he wasn't a um, full royal, and then his son wasn't a full royal, that gives a little bit more more depth to the whole Pharaoh's firstborn son being killed. Um, if he had a son with Hatshepsut, which would have been fully royal child, uh, or half royal because he was half royal, but it would have been Hatshepsut's son. So it would have had a, a greater greater claim to the throne, then that would have explained a little bit more why it was so traumatic, besides losing a son, uh, for Pharaoh to lose that son because it would have been the only thing that would have established his his family line. See what I mean? And so now it's kind of had a little bit more of a troubling situation for the for the area. In fact, it, it kind of got the family line going a little bit off on minor <laughs> minor children for for a little bit. Um, so it says that those who wanted his life were dead. Uh, when, when Moses is out in the desert in exile, uh, when Moses is out in the desert in exile, uh, God tells Moses that the, all those who wanted his life, uh, that, that they're all dead. Well, if it was Tethmosis II, this, this fits perfectly well, because uh, Tethmosis II wasn't even born at the time that Moses killed the Egyptian. So um, now that we're two pharaohs down after that, while Moses has been in the desert for 40 years, this perfectly times out uh, to affirm that. Um, it says that uh, or Tethmosis II uh, claims to have had a campaign against some Shasu, which are Bedouins, nomads, um, which we don't really have a clear outcome of how that battle went. This could be his attack against Israel, um, where he had this... You know, terrible loss, um, since he doesn't really give us a outcome of how that went. <laughs> so you know, there's that. Um, once again, that's not a clear uh, that's not a clear sa thing of saying that this was Exodus, this was Israel. These are all interesting. They add depth to the story from Exodus, but none of these things give us a clear proof. Now, the Shasu they're gonna come they're gonna come and play later. So um, just for for now, remember Shasu of Yahweh, and then we, when we look at the the um, the con Joshua's conquest and all that, that'll come back into play. Um, so there are some people who bring up the fact that at the time of the Exodus, where Moses led the people out of Israel, I'm sorry, out of Egypt, um, that Egypt had some um, some mining operations going on, and so they would have ran to them and had problems there. That is true. At the time that we've dated the Exodus, though, those weren't there yet. So that would have fit, and they would have had a perfectly fine fine time with that. Um, they would have been, been able to go straight through on that. Um, I don't know if you guys remember James Hoffmeyer's lecture where he said about the way of the wilderness, that southern route. They would have been able to take that without much of any um, problems. Um, as far as where it says that... Um, God didn't want to take them the direct route. Uh, Hoffmeyer already covered this. There was there was that uh, border fortress, and so when Israel went to leave, God had them turn back around where they were facing it, and it looked like they were trapped between the sea and the fortress and just kind of stuck, um, which Hoffmeyer talked about all this. Uh, and so it was the perfect incentive to uh, get Pharaoh to follow them. It was... Uh, that that all fits. That fortress was there at this time, so we're all we're all good there. So this is a map that shows uh, just some of the little bit of a problem that we now have. Okay, so at the time that we've dated the Exodus, the pharaohs of Egypt lived in a city called Thebes. There, and the Israelites lived in the land of Goshen. There. So we're talking about hundreds of miles. So now we have a little bit of a problem because most of the stuff makes it out to be like the plagues of Egypt happened very rapidly and that 
um, Israel, you know, was like right outside Pharaoh's temple and stuff. And, 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 it, and I mean, if you've seen the movies and stuff, it always looks like that. You, Pharaoh just like walks out on his balcony and here's the slaves, you know. And, and so then we have a little bit of a problem. Is, 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 is this going to work or is the model of Israel being in the same place as Pharaoh, does, is that workable? Which of the true views, uh, two views is correct? So we're going we're to come back to that idea, but before we get there, I want to look at, at some general proofs. Now we're getting into things that go a little bit, a little bit closer to proof. Not quite, but closer. Um, we have Vizier uh, Rechmir's tomb, Rechmire, uh, and in his tomb we have a relief that shows... Um, slaves uh, building brick with straw at the exact same time that Israel was supposed to have been there. So we know that this was a practice there. Um, we have many, many reliefs uh, of uh, Semitic peoples who Israel Israelites were Semitics uh, migrating in. That that's totally totally fits. Um, we have reliefs of Egyptians and slaves doing manual labor of all different all kinds of different kinds. And if you remember in the story of Exodus. Pharaoh clearly says that his workers are working with the Israelites, and then when Moses first comes, he says, okay, now you guys have to work by yourselves, get the straw by yourselves, make the brick by yourselves, and you have to meet your same quota as before. So that fits too. There's nothing here that says this does not fit. So in Exodus 5.5, 5, the Pharaoh says this. He says, Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. So we know that this probably isn't the same Pharaoh from chapter 1, but he's saying pretty much the same thing. It seems like he was still concerned about an uprising um, of some kind, with once, which once again we, we know that um, every time that a Pharaoh came to, came to power, the, the nation south of Egypt – always rebelled and so they had to go every single time there was a new pharaoh and squash a rebellion so it's not like it was beyond the realm of possibility that a people would would rebel um besides that um being concerned about your slaver your slaves rising up against you that's not really a new a new fear that 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 that's something that that would make sense as well um okay so a lot of estimates of the plagues of egypt are that it took about a year for the for the um, for the different plagues of Egypt to to fully work itself out. If that's the case, then the traveling time for Moses wouldn't have been that big of an issue. Okay, the way of the wilderness it goes through here and here. Okay, so it's possible that he could have gone in and then gone down. That that's totally understandable. I mean, he was a nomad. He was used to traveling. Is that wouldn't have been that big of a deal. And then plus, if the plagues really did take a year to carry out, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that he, he did do a little bit of traveling, possibly even going to Goshen, and then back down to Thebes. I mean, that, that's possible. It's not like we're on a time crunch here. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, so we, we ha it, it appears, if, if my dating is correct, that Pharaoh is way down in Thebes. Which, if you look at Exodus and try to take off the movies that you've seen, the pictures that you've seen, those kinds of things, and just take it for what it is, it's not that difficult to imagine that Pharaoh was very distant from the Israelites. I'll show you a couple verses, and um, I'll let you come to your conclusions. You can you can take it or leave it. That's totally fine. Like I said, you can reject my dating. That's totally fine. Um, but my dating is the only thing that I've that I believe has proof to show that it fits. Every other dating method I see, it always ends with you've got no proof. Um, so let's let's look at this. Uh, Exodus four twenty four says this. At a lodging place. Now don't necessarily think like an inn. Um, it's also the same for like um, an encampment at the encampment place. So like if he was a nomad, he was traveling with with a tent, for instance, at the place where he pitched his tent could be the same thing. So don't don't get carried away there. At the lodging place on the way, or at a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Um, I'm sorry, I am in the, reading the wrong place. Oh, no, 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 I'm not. Um, so this is implying that Moses is doing traveling to get from where he was to the place where Pharaoh is. This is, this is taking some time. 
Um, then there's other time, other spot, spots where it kind of implies that there's time in the travel and that Israel is separated from Pharaoh. Chapter 9, verse 7 says, And Pharaoh sent, sent someone to find out, and behold, not one of the livestock of Israel was dead. Now, if Israel really was in the same city as Pharaoh, he wouldn't have had to send to find out. Yeah, they would know. They would just know. I mean, you could just look outside and say, yep, their cattle didn't die. So the fact that they sent seems to imply that they, they were separated by some amount of space. Now, this isn't to say that all Israel was gathered in the same town. That's not to say that. We already looked at this last week, that the possibility of them being spread out possibly throughout all of Egypt. We don't know. Um, then chapter 10, verse 23. They did not see one another, nor did any rise from his place for three days. Talking about the Egyptians uh, in, the, um, in the part where, the, where it went dark. But all the people of Israel had light where they lived, implying once again that there's some kind of a space. Now, when I was a kid, I imagined it something like this. A ring of light over where the is Israelite was in, in, a, in a pool of darkness. But it seems to be like that's not what it's talking about. It seems like this area is dark, that area is light. That makes so much right, like on the Lion King. <laughs> that makes so much you must worse. never go there. <laughs> uh, chapter 12, verse 3. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house. Why did he have to plan so far in advance? Why did he have to tell someone else to go tell? This, once again, seems to imply that they're not all together in the same place. Uh, and once again, so, okay, it's possible that Moses is traveling back and forth. That is possible. In many cases, it seems to imply that. But also remember that Aaron's helping him with things and that he is in communication with the elders of Israel, although that, com that communication isn't on the greatest of terms. <laughs> Israel's kind of upset at Moses. Moses kind of, is kind of disappointed at how, this, how long this is taking. Uh, chapter 12, verse 41 uh, says, uh, At the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Aha, you might say. This proves that um, Israel couldn't have been spread out because... How could they have been spread out and leave in the exact same day? We're talking about hundreds of miles here. Well, once again, the answer is that you shouldn't think things too literally. At the end of 400 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord began to go out from the land of Egypt. Now, hold on. You just changed the Bible. Well, actually, no. If you look at chapter 14, verse 20, they're still not out of Egypt chapters later. And look at this. They're, they're at the Red Sea. It says this. Coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel, and there was a cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. This is this is the story of Egypt. I mean, sorry, Israel at the border of Egypt, still not out, and going into nighttime, and God has to protect them at night so that the Pharaoh doesn't attack them at night. Once again, showing that clearly they didn't leave that very same day. So, is there a contradiction? No, no. no. On that day at at midnight. All the, new, all the firstborn are dying. So Egypt rises up together and say, get out. So they start moving out at that very moment. That, that's a true statement. Just because the thought doesn't carry over. I'll give you another example of when the thought doesn't carry over. Is in chapter 12, uh, it says, where are you? In verse 33, the Egyptians were urgent with the people. I'm sorry, no, it's up in four, verse 40, chapter 12, verse 40. The time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. Actually, that's the time that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the descendants of Israel, from the time that the promise was given to the time that they left, and when you say lived in Egypt, well, and the surrounding area for 430 years. So I mean, it's not it's not an exact idea. Israel, he, Hebrew, constantly shows us examples of generalized thought. They didn't th like okay when we think about stuff, we think exact. If I say I biked to La Luz, you expect me to have biked to La Luz, not in the area. But in Hebrew thought, they could have said something like, well, I biked to La Luz, and actually I biked to Tularosa. It's more of a, a generalized idea. Um, they, they did have methods. It wasn't just like complete chaos in a language. But like let's say, for instance, uh, La Luz was bigger than Tularosa. Well, then they would have emphasized the bigger city. 
See what I mean? That kind of stuff. It, they didn't have the exact, precise, scientific, you know, idea of the world that we do. Well, they had a more generalized term. Yes. We still do that nowadays. Like if I live, like if someone asks me where I live in Texas, I say I live by Lubbock. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't live in Lubbock. I lived in Crosby, Tennessee. Rawls. And her and Herford. Yeah, <laughs> and so I, I didn't live actually in Lubbock. I lived by Lubbock. Yeah. Nobody knows the smaller towns. So like when I lived in Elmhurst, I always do this at Tule, um, or La Luz. I yeah. never specified exactly. Yeah, which are all great points, guys. So if if we still do it in our speech today, how much more for a language? I mean, for a culture that wasn't scientific. Right. So great points, guys. Great points. Um. Okay. So we looked at that. Plus, being a, a, a population so large, I mean, you don't expect things to happen in one day. Right. Either, right. You know, 600,000 people. <laughs> it's like a wave. You just have to wait till it hits the end. <laughs> <laughs> so that brings up a, 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 one, another problem. We've got these people from all over the land of Egypt moving, and then by chapter 14, they seem to be going in the same direction. It takes them a couple chapters to get there, but by chapter 14, it seems like they're they're moving in the same direction, more or less, and more or less in the same area, but still in, in the land of Egypt. It seems like there's two possibilities. First off, it seems like Moses told them ahead of time, on the 10th, be ready to go, in which case maybe they rendezvoused and were ready to go that night. For instance, when it says to put the blood on the on the doorpost, Maybe it's the doorpost of the tent rather than of houses, uh, in which case maybe they moved their tents to all together in one place. Possibility. Um, and then in which case when Moses said, be ready on the tent at midnight, they're going to kick us out, then maybe they were like, okay. Or here's another idea. Maybe Moses had told them about a rendezvous point. Uh, maybe as they started to run, they just all naturally took the same route because of the, high, the way the highways were. That's possible. Um, maybe after they started getting kicked out, Moses went through and started rallying them all together into a more unified force. Maybe, maybe that happened. We don't really know exactly how it happened. Um, but there are possibilities besides saying that it didn't happen. Um, so we really don't know how long it took for the, um, the day of the – or the night of the Passover from the time that they crossed the Red Sea. We really don't, don't know. Probably, probably wasn't too long. So – Moses, when he's detailing the travel time, and I believe it's the book of Numbers, he doesn't say how long it took. It, he talks about the t traveling time from this place to this place, but he doesn't really say specific at, about the first part, the getting together to the Red Sea. So potentially think mm, maybe even up to a week or two, but probably not that long. If most of Israel was in northern and... Moses could travel 20, 20, hour, 20 miles a day. We're looking at a travel time of somewhere around 10 to 15 days for Moses to get to northern, um, northern Egypt from Thebes. So, possible. It's possible. Okay. Um, did I miss that? Maybe I did. Where did I go? Nope, I didn't. Okay, good. So now let's look at some more specific proofs. Um, Setmos is saying it himself. Um, he died with cysts on him, uh, the only pharaoh to have these to have these marks at the time of death. There were other pharaohs or other people in the royal court who had them, but they had time for them to heal more before their death. It doesn't specifically say that the pharaoh died when. Israel left Egypt. So that's our problem there. It's possible that he died, but it's also possible that he lived. We do know that his body was badly maimed after his death. Sometime after his death, people cut it up. Maybe out of irritation with him for letting the thing happen. Uh, I don't know. Maybe grave robbers did it. We really don't know. Um, by the way, his dead, dead body was pretty bad mutilated. Um, and... His cyst didn't have time to heal. He had some kind of a disease that left him in an extreme weakened state. We know that. Um, if you want more information, you can read um, Smith, The Royal Mummies, uh, Gaston, Mespero, uh, Gaston Mespero, History of Egypt, Chaldea, Assyria, Babylonia, and Assyria, Volume 4, 
Um, Dr. Clank uh, did a um, did a um, analysis of his a more recent analysis. I think it's called a CT scan um, of uh, Thetmose II. By the way, uh, I believe it was Smith who did the original. Um, what's it called uh, when you analyze a dead body? Autopsy. Uh, autopsy in eighteen eighty something. Um, and then Gaston Mespro, uh, I believe, wrote a few co comments about it in his. So anyways, uh, so this is something that's not just th – this is verifiable by people who have done autopsies on the mummies. We're not just pulling this out of thin air. It has a paper trail there. Um, so this is the only pharaoh who died with those body marks. So we have the problem that it happened within 50, 50 years of when the Bible says it happened. Assuming that our dating is correct, and it's the only pharaoh that has it in all of the pharaohs that we have right at that time frame. That kind of leaves us with the conclusion of there's a strong possibility that this is the guy. Once again, that's not absolute fact, but it's a strong possibility. Um, his death is very unclear in Egyptian records. We don't even know how long he reigned. It might have been 1479. He could have reigned three years. I believe the other estimate is 18 years, or one guy said somewhere over 20 years. So we don't know from Egyptian records how long his reign was, how that went for him, anything really. And uh, the Bible really doesn't clarify, presumably because they were already gone. You know, <laughs> they went out into the desert. They weren't like, hey, over there, did Pharaoh die too? I mean, <laughs> They, they were out in the desert. In fact, all that it really says is that they saw that some of the Egyptians had died and were lying dead on the shore. They didn't see the whole picture. We don't know how far away the shore was. We don't know how many they saw dead. We don't know the whole picture there. So there's definitely a lot of room for, for stuff there. Had Sheepset, who was Thutmose II's wife, I talked to you about, about that, who, if... Fair, if Thutmose the Second's firstborn was born from head sheep's that would have been a grave loss, a really big loss, more than just losing a son, losing an heir, or losing a title. This is really, really important. And it also reflected poorly on your family line because you were supposed to be gods, and there's just a whole thing there. Okay, So that that's definitely something. But anyways, um, she reigns for 20 years it's technically kind of a co-reign but not really because she made all the calls but she made all the call or most of the calls they assume when Thutmose was saying was still alive so <laughs> it's really not nothing big there um and uh, so she uh tutors Thutmose the third who's the successor um and pretty much it's it's she's the she's the pharaoh <laughs> that's, that's pretty much how that goes um she didn't go on any expeditions for 20 years the question is why? When every pharaoh would go on campaigns, why did she not? Well, if the forces were weakened from Israel's little excursion, that would explain. But once again, that's assumption. We don't have fact for that happening. We just know that she didn't go on any campaigns. Um, she mentions on one of her inscriptions that she feared what people would think. Why would she fear this? This is not... This is not something that pharaohs typically talked about. They they typically just said, "I'm you know, I'm God's gift to the world. I am God." You know this kind of stuff. And so why would she bother saying this unless her situation was a little precarious? Now, as we've seen, a lot of times what politicians will do to gain favor is to build a bunch of things to distract people about how miserable they are. That's exactly what Hatshepsut did. She built all kinds of stuff instead of going on campaigns. So for 20 years, whereas other pharaohs would be going out winning land and honor and money and stuff, she was staying at home building stuff. So we're kind of left with, hmm, that's kind of curious. And then we have another problem. Either Thutmose the Third, Thutmose the Third, <laughs> Thutmose the Third, or his successor, um, badly damaged our records of Hatshepsut. So the question is why. That's a very interesting question. Why? Why would they have done this? There's been some speculation, but no clear answers as to something that actually seems plausible. Anyways, um, so we have two very valuable inscriptions, the one that says the fear, but there's an even more more important one. It was, from the, it was found at a temple in Spares Artemidus. I'm going to read that to you in just a minute. 
and you'll see how I think this is kind of the clincher. Besides the cysts on Thutmose II. Besides that, I think that this is really the clincher. Um, so then we have Thutmose III, who was um, Thutmose II's heir, uh, who was after Hatshepsut. Um, he attacked Canaan, yes, but he attacked Canaan while Israel was still in the wilderness. So a lot of people have said, see, that couldn't possibly fit because Egypt had control over Canaan. Actually, it seems like Egypt had control over Western Canaan. And if you read the book of Joshua and Judges, you know that Israel was more in Eastern Canaan. So it's very possible that Egypt kind of just kept their distance and Israel just kind of kept their distance and they all just kind of ignored each other, hoping that they'd go away. It's very possible. Um, and we'll look at that more in when we talk about the conquest. Absolutely. Uh, but there, So there's definitely more to be said about that. So this is Hatshepsut's inscription from Spiros Atimidus. From the time when the Asiatics, now Asiatics, those are the Hyksos, the Hyksos, the, the, the northern rulers, okay? Remember I said that Egypt had the northern rulers and the southern rulers? Okay, so the south had conquered the Asiatics, the Hyksos, and they refer to them here from the time when the Asiatics were in the midst of the delta and Avaris. Okay, so we know for sure we're talking about the Hyksos. Then she says this, with vagrants in their midst. Who are these vagrants? And then we get to the next line, toppling what had been made. Okay, so it's a little bit unclear. Who's doing the toppling? The vagrants or the Asiatics? Well, it seems like she's talking about the vagrants. It, it, I'm, not, I'm not an Egyptologist. I could be wrong about this. That's my own opinion. I admit that. However, the, then she goes on to say this. They ruled without the sun, who, remember, the sun is a god, but also the sun was blotted out in the... Um, in the um, plagues. And he did not act by God's decree down to my own incarnation. So here we have a little bit of... She, she's, she's kind of bringing a complaint about her God, which apparently became a theme for a while where one of the major gods of Egypt seems to have, starting from about this point, seems to have taken somewhat of a back seat. So it affected... Something affected their entire religion that's kind of interesting um she brings a gripe about him she complains about that most a second or i don't know if it's exactly you would qualify it as a complaint so much as she didn't glorify that most a second eh, i'll just live with that she didn't th unglorify that most a second um she says about how she's how she's scared there's obviously some class some problem that happened that they're all hit you know tiptoeing around but everybody knows about it but that's just not in any of the descriptions and then she says this about vagrants in their midst this seems to be a, a vague uh, criticism of Israel. Once again, we don't know for sure because she doesn't actually say Israel. But how big of a coincidence that all these things just happen to fit in exactly when we dated the Exodus? That's something that needs to be considered. So that's the strong that between this and the cysts on Thutmose II, to me, are the strongest arguments for this being the correct dating. I could be wrong. And I'm more than willing to listen to anybody who has another idea. But so far, this is the best bet that we've got. And I'll give you one better. It's the only bet we've got. The dating in the 1200s, there's, there's nothing. We've got nothing. I mean, b besides a bunch of rhetoric about what could have been and all these things, we've got nothing. Uh, the 1445, the popular accepted date, we've got nothing there too. 1479, we've got something. And it's within 50 years, and it's the only other time in Egyptian history when we've got things that actually fit to back up the story. So I'll let you be the judge. Um, next week we will move on to the conquest, and we'll start looking at, um, at a lot of those kinds of ideas. Any questions or comments? No? We're good. I'm going to stop the recording. Da 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 da